Okay, so just let me uh, share with you a case. I've got a 73-year-old lady who came to see us uh, uh, in the Falls Clinic after being referred. But what happened was that uh, she slipped and fell when she was shopping outside, uh, uh, I think around in Mid Valley. But uh, anyway, she sustained a soft tissue injury over her left ankle. She was seen in the emergency department, x-ray of the left ankle was done, and she was told that there was no fracture and she was discharged home. So this is not unusual of what you would normally see in someone who has fallen, an older person who has fallen. And if you have uh, watched the webinar this morning uh, by Professor Tan Mopi, she'll tell you uh, the effects of falls in an older person and the things that you can do to prevent falls as well. So uh, this lady come and tell us that, you know, oh, I'm so glad I did not break my bones. But then again, we have to think about what may be the cause of a fall. And obviously, you know, these kinds of, uh, of uh, footwear is not going to help with uh, breaking fall. Uh, she also was found to have unsteady gait with knee OA, poor vision and orthostatic hypertension. But when a person has fallen, it is important not to look at uh, a fall being a minor issue, you have to think about the possibility of fracture in these older people. So falls and fragility fracture are, should be looked at in, uh, in unison itself. And uh, in terms of falls, it affects about one third of all those older people above 65 years old. And most of the fragility fracture occur following a fall and majority of hip fractures have occurred because a person has fallen. And the important thing is that if you've fallen once, then your likelihood of falling again is very high. And falls itself is an independent predictor of fracture risk. So despite a person's BMD not actually, uh, 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 is, is actually more than negative 2.5, but if they keep falling, their risk of fracture is high. So I'm just gonna show you this diagram, uh, as you can see. Uh, yes, uh, reduced uh, bone mineral density increases uh, someone's risk of having fracture, but falls is just as important as well. So hence, if you've got anyone who has fallen, uh, think about their uh, fracture risk. And if you've seen anyone who has osteoporosis, think about their falls risk as well. Okay, so how do we assess anyone's uh, uh, fracture risk? So yes, you can do a bone mineral density, and that's the gold standard way by doing a DEXA scan to look at what a patient's bone mineral density is. That's because we find that the incidences of fracture increases as, uh, as you see a reduction in a patient's T-score. And uh, the risk of fracture increases twofold for each decrease in BMD, as you can see on the picture uh, on your right, uh, and H as well. So H and BMD itself are independent predictors of future fractures. And uh, this is just to tell you about uh, one of the large studies done in America, and this is called the NORA studies. And this is usually quoted many, many times in, any, in, in anyone who is doing an osteoporosis talk. Uh, it's just to highlight that although low BMD of less than 2.5 uh, standard deviation increases a person's risk of fracture. I just want to show you that majority of fracture occurs in patients whose T-scores are actually better than negative 2.5. And you know, 67% of them had a T-score of actually greater than negative 2.0. So this is to tell you that the BMD is not the only predictive of a uh, uh, of fracture and it also tells you that patients who are in the osteopenic range can also get fractures as well. So hence you have to use your clinical judgment on top of just doing BMD uh, to assess a patient's fracture risk. Okay, so the other way that we can assess a patient's fracture risk is by doing the FRAX score uh, in situations or in centers where the access to a DEXA scan is going to be difficult. You can still assess a patient's risk by using this FRAC score as long as you have internet connection. Eh? And uh, you can actually put in all the patient's details as required on the, uh, on the internet itself. And uh, you will have to choose the specific country origin of the patient and ethnicity to assess this uh, uh, accurately. And there's currently no Malaysian validated data. So what we do is we use the Singaporean one. So you could say whether it's a patient, is it a Singaporean Chinese, Singaporean Malay or Singaporean Indian. So that helps you a little bit uh, to assess their fraction. 
fracture risk. And according to the Malaysian osteoporosis uh, guideline, as well as the NOC guideline, if your fracture risk of major osteoporosis is more than 20%, or if your hip fracture risk in 10 years is more than 3%, then there is an indication for treatment. This is especially true for patients who may be in the osteopenic range. But then again, uh, the FRAX2 also has its uh, limitation. I mean, sorry, this is to actually look at what are the risk uh, factors that's included in the FRAX2. So uh, we assess the patient's age because all these are risk factors that is independent from your BMD scores. So age, uh, gender, previous osteoporotic fracture, femoral neck BMD, a patient with low body mass index, or if you take medication that accelerate bone loss, such as uh, glucocorticoids, then your risk is increased. Uh, patients who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis or patients who may have what we call secondary causes of osteoporosis, such as diabetes, hypogonadism, or malnutrition, chronic liver disease, uh, as well as parental hip fracture, smoking, and alcohol. So the FRAX actually incorporates the other risk factors on top of your BMD scores. So if you do not have a T-score to be included in the calculation, calculation you can still get a, a risk assessment uh, and you just leave that blank. Okay, but there are also limitations with the FRAX score uh, because it does underestimate fracture risk for uh, for. Uh, for risk factors, which may be dose dependent. So although smoking and alcohol increases your risk of fracture, but they are dose dependent. So you have to have like, you know, 30 pack years of smoking to increase your risk of fracture. And if you drink alcohol, like, you know, one glass of red wine a day, a day itself, it does not increase your risk. So that's excessive alcohol intake. Yes, it does. And patients who are who have multiple fracture has a much higher risk of developing fracture than if you only have a single fracture. So that is actually not captured in the FRAX score or even the dose of your glucocorticoid usage. So a dose of more than 7.5 milligram increases your risk of fracture much more than if you are only taking anything less than 5 milligrams. So uh, previous clinical vertebral fracture is, is also not captured in your FRAX uh, because Anyone who has a vertebral fracture, risk of having another vertebral fracture is about two times higher. Okay. Uh, and we also know that FRAX does not accommodate all other risk factors such as falls, like I've mentioned, uh, 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 patients who may have high bone turnover markers or pa patients who may recently have fracture or, or actually type 2 diabetes itself. So it does not replace clinical judgment, but it helps you to think about all the other risk factors for you to do something about it. Yeah, so a fracture begets fracture. So if you've had a, 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 a fracture in the past, it doubles your risk of uh, another fracture. So like what I've mentioned, if you have a vertebral fracture, uh, your risk of developing another vertebral fracture actually is four times higher. Uh, but if you've got a risk of other fractures, your, the, the, the risk of developing other fractures are actually twice as much. So, what is the high, I mean, when will people develop the next fracture if they've recently had a fracture? So we find that uh, the highest rate of the refracturing is within the first one year. So hence, when you think about uh, assessment or secondary prevention, do not wait till too late. You know, if anyone presents to your clinic uh, telling you that I've recently had a fracture, you have to think about initiating treatment or uh, for the management of osteoporosis. Okay, this is just another uh, risk fra uh, fracture risk assessment, which is the OSTA. Uh, this is mainly for the Asian, and when it was uh, validated, it was mainly for women. It's simple and easy to administer. You only require to know what a patient's age and the body weight is. Uh, it, you can use it for men as well. Uh, it's been shown, but the cutoff is slightly different. So when you're using this, uh, OSTA with this cutoff, you have to only use it for women itself. Okay, so uh, like I've mentioned, uh, I want to just talk a little bit more about vertebral uh, fracture and vertebral risk assessment. So uh, the NOC guideline has mentioned that if you've got anyone above the age of 70 for women and above the age of 80 for men, and if your BMD T score is osteopenic, then you may consider doing vertebral imaging because uh, if, you're, if there is presence of fracture, then that means your risk of a future fracture is higher. So you would consider initiation of treatment. 
But if you're anything, uh, uh, men or women age 50 or less, but you have those specific factors that I've mentioned at the bottom, then you will also consider doing vertebral imaging. So you basically just ask for uh, 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 AP and lateral uh, thoracic and lumbar uh, spine x-ray to look for any presence of silent compression fractures in the past. Okay, so this is the NOF and the Malaysian CPG treatment guideline for osteoporosis. So if you've got any patients who's already had a spine fracture or has a hip fracture, they automatically uh, should be considered for treatment uh, unless proven otherwise. Or if you have a, a DEXA scan with a T-score less than negative 2.5 in your hip or your spine, then these patients should be uh, uh, initiated on treatment. But if the patient is at the, at the osteopenic range, like I've mentioned, but your FRAX uh, scoring shows that, you know, the major osteoporosis risk is more than 20% or your hip fracture risk is more than 3%, then you could consider initiation of treatment as well. Okay, so what does personalised treatment mean? So basically, uh, it really means that we should tailor the treatment of osteoporosis, especially in older persons. So rather than just looking at uh, the, uh, the risk factors and addressing them, and when you are choosing the treatment, you should consider uh, all these aspects. So for example, the severity of osteoporosis, if the T-score is very, very low, <clears throat> let's say like negative four, the kind of treatment that you choose may differ. You may want to use a stronger anti-resorptive or anabolic agent uh, in this group of patients. You also want to look at what is the patient's comorbidity because with older persons, there may be a higher prevalence of chronic kidney disease because that would also determine which kind of treatment you can choose. And as you understand that uh, a lot of older persons may have polypharmacy, they're already on a whole long list of medication. Uh, they may or may not want to take another oral treatment. So you have to discuss about, you know, what sort of agent would be best for them. And in patients who have problems with mobility or uh, cognitive impairment, they may not be able to understand certain uh, strict instruction that is required for, uh, uh, for example, bisphosphonates. And uh, you also want to address how much support they're getting, how much social support in terms of the cost of the medication and family support that will help in terms of their adher adherence to treatment. So uh, these need to be addressed. Uh, before you initiate treatment because that would actually determine how successful you are in treating and uh, managing uh, osteoporosis in older persons. So if, uh, if your patient has osteoporosis or a recent fragility fracture, so the universal recommendation is number one, if they're smoking, get them to stop smoking and ensure that they uh, avoid excessive alcohol intake. Remember about false prevention because there's no point you treating osteoporosis when you have not addressed their false risk because they will just fracture again. Uh, the other thing is ensure they had adequate calcium or vitamin D intake, adequate nutrition and protein intake, and also exercise. So I will focus on the last three because I think false prevention has already been mentioned in the earlier webinar. Okay, so calcium and vitamin intake. So if possible, get your patients to, 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 to have adequate dietary calcium and vitamin D. Uh, well, it's a bit difficult to get vitamin D through diet alone. So sunlight exposure is one of the other options. So you would, uh, you would want them to have uh, adequate intake of calcium about one gram a day and uh, vitamin D about 800 IU per day. Uh, so if your patients even you, you could do a dietary calcium intake scoring and see uh, how much more calcium they need. So if they do not take adequate calcium through diet, you may have to supplement them with uh, tablets itself. And just a short note that if they take calcium supplementation, make sure they don't take more than 500 milligrams each time because even if you take more, uh, you won't be able to absorb that much as well in one go. And the other thing is, as a lot of older people with chronic disease, they may be on PPI. And just to let you know that PPI reduces gastric acidity, which is actually required for the absorption of most calcium uh, preparation, except calcium citrate though. So uh, ensure that, you know, check and see whether does your patient still need to take the PPI. If they don't need to, then you just remove it. Okay. Okay, uh, I can't stress this enough. So besides calcium and vitamin D, please make sure that your patients has adequate nutrition. 
because a lot of older people may have sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass and strength. Uh, bone and muscle are closely uh, interrelated. So if you have poor muscle mass, you have poor bone strength as well. So uh, you need to make sure that they take adequate protein and calorie in their diet. So calorie intake about 30 kilocalories per kilo and protein intake about 1 to 1.2 grams per kilo body weight uh, daily. But if you're malnourished, then you could actually go for higher protein intake. Uh, uh, what, what, what would the adequate nutrition and protein does? It actually increases the muscle mass and increases muscle mass actually reduces uh, the chances of a person falling again. And that also improves your bone health. Okay, yes, the other thing is about exercise. So we know that prolonged break rest actually increases bone loss. So exercise is important and you would be thinking about things like weight bearing and muscle strengthening exercise. I mean, they can do your usual aerobic exercise, but you know, these two are important uh, because it has proven to increase uh, bone mass itself. So this is just a different uh, uh, algorithm for you to take and to, according to what sort of uh, patient population you have. So if they've had a recent fracture, then it's slightly lower impact. Or if they can't actually exercise because they, are, they, 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 they can't walk very much, then at least you know, encourage them to do some physical activity rather than none itself. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the pharmacological treatment of osteoporosis. I will not discuss about Tibolon, estrogen or the serms because uh, these uh, may not be as effective as the other anti-resorptive and anabolic agent. And in older population, we generally do not uh, prescribe these medication itself. So if your patient population is like in your 50s, then yes. Or if you're anything, uh, if you're more than 10 years uh, postmenopausal, then these agents are not uh, 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 are contraindicated for older people. So uh, what sort of agent do we use? So they are bisphosphonates. Uh, they, we have rank ligand inhibitors such as denosumab and also parathyroid hormone receptor agonists. So this table actually basically shows you uh, the preparation that we have in Malaysia. You have alendronate, resendronate, ibandronate, salendronate acid as well. And most of these agents actually works and reducing fracture risk. Uh, only thing that has uh, un uh, not determined uh, effect is the uh, ibandronate, uh, just because that in the studies, the patient population was not powered to show a reduction, uh, to show uh, evidence of reduction in hip or non vertebral fracture itself. But the rest are, are, are fairly effective. So I just like to show you uh, the side of action of these three different uh, agents. So for example, your bisphosphonate, after you've taken it, it gets, uh, it binds to your bone surfaces. So what happens is that your osteoclasts, uh, when they attach to these bone surfaces, uh, they get impregnated with this bisphosphonate uh, uh, in, uh, bones, and uh, that would actually cause us uh, apoptosis of this osteoclast and they die off. So bisphosphonate is the only one that binds into the bone and hence even when you have a drug holiday, uh, your, 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 your BMD does not drop so drastically uh, because it's actually in your bones already. But as uh, denosumab, how does it work? Uh, so your osteoclast uh, uh, cells actually have a, uh, 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 a receptor called the rank receptor and they, they, they will require the rank ligand to bind to this rank receptor to activate the osteoclast. So what denosumab does is, is that it, it, it binds and inhibit this rank ligand and prevent the uh, maturation of this osteoclast and helps cause uh, 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 cell death in the osteoclast itself. Where well, parathyroid hormone is the only bone formation uh, agent, it's an anabolic agent. Uh, it actually stimulates your osteoblast to form bones. So it's the only bone uh, building agent itself at the moment. Okay, so does uh, bisphosphonate work? So yes, I mean, that's it's one of the oldest agents that we have. Uh, and it is cost effective. So one of the papers, the, the initial papers, the FIT trial shows that in patients with pre-existing fractures, that means we're talking about secondary prevention. So this group of patients already had a previous fracture. And if you put them on alendronate versus placebo, you will find that uh, patients on treatment actually has increased BMD on all the sites measured, whether it's your femoral neck or total hip or your spine.